Uh, well, I got the uh, homework uh, document that you sent me, so I'm, I'll uh, start by taking a look at that. Uh, you should have the homework in front of you so that you can follow along as we look at this. So I'm looking now at number one. Um, okay. Okay, one point I would make here for number one, as far as notation, I noticed that you wrote an equals sign here. So you're making it look like the log of 100 equals 10 to the y. Uh, but that's actually, or, or the log of 100 equals 100. Uh, that, that, but that would be incorrect. So we shouldn't have an equal sign here. Uh, the best thing to do is to say that you're making these into equations. Log of 100 equals y. And then this is a separate equation. So that, that's a notational point. But you don't want to say that the log of 100 equals 10 to the y. That's just incorrect. Instead, for example, for part A, we could say the log of 100 equals y, and then as a separate equation down below, so 10 to the y equals 100, these are all separate equations. It would be incorrect to write them like this. The equations are not equal to each other. The equations, equations are not equal to each other. It's just that we can figure out this equation from this equation. If you wanted to, you could write an arrow here to show that this equation implies this equation, but it doesn't make sense to say the equations are equal to each other because they're not. So you got those questions right, but it's always best to use good notation. But anyway, th these are the correct answers for number one, so I'll take a look at number two. Okay, that's a correct answer uh, for number two. Let's look at number three. So this is the chemical equation for water autoionization. This is the mathematical equation for water autoionization. Now this next step here isn't really quite correct because you said here that uh, you wrote 10 to the negative 7 times 10 to the negative 7 equals 10 to the negative 14. Is H plus concentration always equal to 10 to the negative 7? No. No. So we don't want to go on to this next step. This is what you just what you would get in pure water. In pure water, the two concentrations have to be equal. So they're both 10 to the negative 7. But does this equation only apply to pure water? No. This equation applies to any solution. This equation applies to any solution, not just to pure water. So this step would be correct. Uh, but this step is just a special case. It's not the general equation. Anyway, these two equations were correct. Let's look at number four. This looks like good answers for number four. So we don't want to confuse the water auto-ionization with acid ionization. Those are two separate equations. It looks like you wrote those out correctly. So I'm looking at number 5a. Um, can you tell me what do you have written here? Ten to the fourth times more acidic. Okay. Not ten to the negative four, but ten to the fourth. Good. Yeah, it was just a, a race okay. mistake. And what do you have written here? Ten thousand. What's this? Times. Oh, okay. Looks like a Y. All right, ten thousand times more. How did you get this 10 to the 4th number? Where does that come from? Ten, oh, I told you the question. I subtracted. What did you subtract? The exponents. Okay. So first, you would divide the two numbers. And the way to divide the numbers is to subtract the exponents. Okay, that's good. It's always best to, to, um, it's always best to show your work uh, a little bit more. So what you're doing here is 10 to the negative 3 over 10 to the negative 7. When you show your work, that way you know that you're understanding the method uh, a little bit more. But anyway, it looks like you did that correctly, so let me take a look at B. Okay. 
what uh, what do you have written here? What number is this? 10 to the negative fourth. Now, is 10 to the negative fourth a big number or a fraction? It's a fraction. So this answer doesn't quite make sense. It sounds like you're, uh, you wouldn't say something is, you know, one, one ten thousandth more acidic. Uh, so when you're comparing these two numbers, again, you're going to make a fraction. Which of these is bigger, 10 to the negative 3 or 10 to the negative 7? 10 to the negative 3. So when you're comparing them, it makes sense to put that one on the top. And then when you do that, you get the exponent to come out positive. Why did you get 10 to the negative 4? You probably got 10 to the negative 4 because you put the smaller number on the top. Um, that's, probably, that's probably not the best way to compare those because then the answer doesn't really quite make sense. Um, which of these two numbers is bigger? 20. How many times bigger is it? Four times. Is it four times bigger or is it one quarter times bigger? Four times bigger. Yeah, no, do you see why it would be a mistake to say it's one quarter times bigger? That's not really what you're trying to say. So if you were going to compare them, you'd probably want to put the bigger number on top. So it came out to be four. If you put the smaller number on top, then you can't. You wouldn't want to say that 20 is one quarter times bigger. You'd want to say that five is one fourth as big as 20. So those those are two separate ideas. So this answer this answer is actually uh, somewhat incorrect. That this is somewhat incorrect. It doesn't make sense to say that the bigger number is 10 to the negative four times bigger. Uh, okay. Um, did you notice that B was really the same as A? Yes. So I'm just trying to show you how you can, uh, once you get the feel for it, then you can kind of do this in your head. Remember, P is a logarithm, and logarithms are exponents. So you can just say that if I was going to compare these, I would just subtract the exponents, and you can kind of in your head see that there would be a difference of 10 to the fourth between them. Uh, anyway, the, the method, the, the mathematical method you used here of going back to H plus is uh, also uh, accurate. Okay. So I look at part C. How did you get this number, 0 0.01? That's from uh, it's a one thousandth of one hundredth times more. Should be 0 0.001. But where are you getting that from? I'm subtracting the exponents, but it should be a, a thousand times more acidic. What, what did you get when you subtracted the exponents? Negative 2. 10 to the negative second. So let's just take our time a little with that a little bit more. Remember that we're setting up a fraction. So take a look at that problem. What number would you put on the top of the fraction for part C? Negative 10. Like this? 10 to the negative 10. Okay. Now, do you remember we were just talking over here about how it's useful to put the bigger number on top? 10 to, oh, 10 to the negative 8. Okay. Good. And then what number would you put on the bottom? 10 to the negative 10. Then what? And then subtract. And what do you get when you subtract? Okay. And what is 10 squared? 100. Not 1,000. So again, it'd just be a good idea to write out a few more of your steps on paper. Rather than doing things in our head, it's better to write down a few more of the steps on paper. Um, so again, the point here is that your answer here doesn't quite make sense. It doesn't make sense to say the bigger number is 0 0.01 times bigger. Uh, it's 100 times bigger. What, what you have written down is that it's 1 100th bigger which doesn't quite make sense. So the way, the way to get the answers to come out better is to put the bigger number on the top of the fraction. Then you'll get an answer that uh, makes more sense on that type of problem. Okay, so that was a question you'd actually asked me during our last tutoring session.
but it was actually something that could definitely come up on exam, so I thought it was good to uh, review that. So let's look at number six. I think you must have misread number six. Why don't you try number six again? I don't know why I got such a different number. Uh, 4.7. Great. No, it was a very simple mistake. You you just mixed up six and seven. You just oh. took the number for seven when you're doing six. I just wanted to, to go through it once correctly. You, you took the number. This is just not the right number for number six to take the log of. You must have accidentally looked at number seven in the middle of doing number six. Anyway, what, what, was, what was your answer now? Um, 4.721. Okay, that's correct. Let's look at number seven. Well, that's the right answer for number seven. Let's look at number eight. That's the right answer for number eight. So seven and eight are showing that a big Ka, what does a big Ka mean? Um, stronger acid. And what does a big PKA mean? Weaker acid. Okay, good. So we don't want to confuse those. All right, this is a good answer for number nine. This is something that I think a lot of students are not clear about. pKa is telling us how acidic the acid is, and pH is telling us how acidic the solution is. So it looks like that was a good answer for number nine. Number 10. Good. So the key is this applies when both the acid and the conjugate base coexist. This equation applies when both the acid and the conjugate base are in the solution. So number 11, a buffer is when we have a weak acid and a conjugate base. That's good. What's the one other thing we learned about buffers? Well, I guess there's two other things we learned about buffers. Here's one thing we learned about buffers last time. It consists of a weak acid and the conjugate base. Another thing we learned about buffers is that that's when we applied the henderson hasselbach equation. And do you remember what's one more thing we learned about buffer solutions last time? What's the interesting characteristic of a buffer solution? They resist um, change in pH. So if a chemist wants to create a solution that will resist changes in pH, what type of solution should they create? A buffer solution. And in your body, your body has to resist changes in pH too. So your blood contains, your blood and uh, body fluids contain buffer solutions as well. We'll probably talk more about that as the class goes on. Number 12, that's correct. Number 13. Okay, this is correct uh, for uh, number 13. Um, personally, I find that I think it's best for students to write out the before change after table so they understand how they're applying the, to this. Otherwise, it's hard to keep the different types of problems separate. Otherwise, it's just a mechanical process. Uh, in any case, this is the correct answer. So let's look at number 14. All right, that's the right answer for 14. It's good that you realized that you were getting the POH to begin with. Uh, again, I think it's best for understanding to write the chemical equation in the before change after table, because otherwise it's somewhat mechanical. But in any case, uh, th this is the correct answer for number 14. So number 12, 
was a pure water question. Number 13 was a strong acid question, which was solved differently from number 12. Number 14 is a strong base question, which was solved differently from number 12 and number 13. What are the units on X? Molar. Good. So that whenever you get an answer, it's always best to put units on that as you go. Okay. And now this problem, number 15, this is a weak acid problem, which is different from numbers 12, 13, and 14. So this is a good systematic method that you used here with the before change after table. Uh, you used the approximation method that we talked about before and we plugged in X's. So you can see how you solved questions 12, 13, 14, and 15 all differently from each other. They're all different types of problems. Problems that you did, numbers 1 through 15, I don't think you made any mistakes. There's one careless mistake, but all of those you understood conceptually. So that's good. Do you have the homework problems in front of you? Yes. Okay, well, let's look at those together. I'll take a look at number one. So, looking at this problem here, um, do you have the acid, this is a, a throwback to the acid base problems that we were looking at uh, earlier. Do you have that acid base handout with you that describes the different types of problems? Yes, it's a weak acid problem. Okay, that's actually mistaken. That's not correct. Um, this, is, this does have a weak acid, but it also, we didn't just start with the weak acid. We started with 5 times 10 to the negative 4 molar 8CN. But notice we also started with 3.7 times 10 to the negative 3 molar, molar cyanide. Um, so we started with both the weak acid and its conjugate base. That might seem like a minor detail, but it's not because it changes the whole way we solve the problem. Um, so instead, this should be uh, one of the later uh, types on, uh, in the middle of the, of the chart, weak acid and its conjugate base. What, what's the name of that type of solution when we have a weak acid and its conjugate base? Weak, uh, uh, weak acid and conjugate base solution, you said? Yes, but, but that does that make sense? Do you see why it is a weak acid and it's conjugate base? Yes. Okay. It, it's because we started with both the weak acid and its conjugate base. So, yeah, that, that is what I said. So, my question is, what's the name of that type of solution? There's a special name for a solution that has a weak acid and its conjugate base. Do you remember what we call that? for solution. That's right. Okay, now the reason why that's important is for that type of problem, the method that we learned was to use the henderson hasselbach equation, um, which you did here. Um, what was your answer for question one? 10.069, but I know that's not right now. How do you know it's not right? Because it's an acid that we're using, and that's uh, a basic pH. Ah, okay, it's good that you were thinking about that. It's good that you're thinking about that. Now, you said it's an acid. Who's an acid? HCN. That's right. But remember, just a second ago, we were saying we don't only have the acid. What's the other thing that's present in the solution besides the acid? Conjugate base. And which do we have more of? The, we have more of the conjugate base, yes. So do you see that actually this pH makes good sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's good that you're trying to check your answer. But uh, in fact, this pH makes good sense. We have both an acid and its conjugate base. So it's a little hard to predict whether the answer will come out to be acidic or basic. Um, but in, because in fact we have more base than acid, we shouldn't be too surprised 
that uh, the pH came out to be basic here. Uh, okay, so this answer actually is correct. So the key thing is, for a buffer solution, we can solve the problem using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. The point I wanted to make is that for buffer solutions, you and I did not discuss how to use the before change after table. You should make a note of that in your notes or on the handout. For buffer solutions, you and I did not discuss how to use the before change after table. The before change after table is not necessary for buffer solutions. Um, so you would have been better off leaving it out in this case. Um, I mean, did you notice that your answer here didn't really rely on the buffer solution uh, on, the, on this table at all? When you plugged yeah. into the henderson hasselbalch equation, you weren't using the table. All right, so this table is something that we used for all the other examples that we went over. Strong acid, strong base, and weak acid, but we don't need it for buffer solutions because there's a shortcut. Um, now, it's possible to use the table in this case. It, you could have done this with the table, but we don't need to spend our time on that because we have the shortcut. Um, I did want to point out, though, um, one mistake here. So you said, uh, so how much, how much acid how much of the acid do we have before this reaction begins? 10, uh, 5 times 10 to the negative fourth. Good. That's the number you wrote here? Yeah. How much of its conjugate base did we have before the reaction begins? 3.7 times 10 to the negative third. So do you see that's the number that should have gone here? Okay. Not zero. Now, the reason you wrote down zero is because all the examples that we did in the tutoring, we always put zeros on the product side, but that's just because we never did an example like this with this table. So if you were going to use this table, in this case, you would start with, uh, you would not start with zero of the conjugate base. You would start with 3.7 times 10 to the negative 3 molar of the conjugate base. That's what makes it a buffer, that we're starting with both the acid and the conjugate. Uh, there's some other mistakes in this table as well, but I'm not going to take the time to discuss those with you because you're not, you're not, you don't really need the table for this type of problem. Uh, for this type of problem, we don't. So the, the key thing is that for buffer solutions, you should make a note. For buffer solutions, you don't need the henderson hasselbalch equation. You can just, I'm sorry, <laughs> for buffer solutions, you don't need the start change after table. You can just use the henderson hasselbalch equation. Now let's look at the work that you did over here. You wrote pKa equals 9.2. That is correct. You wrote negative log of Ka equals pKa. That is correct. Um, then I noticed you put in an x here. What does the x stand for in this equation? Ka. So you may as well have just called it Ka. There's no point trading out a... Uh, an, a, a there's no reason losing the abbreviation that makes sense for one that makes less sense. So it would have been best to leave the Ka in here. So here you have 10.10 10 to the... 10 to the negative 9.2 equals x. But what does the x stand for here? Okay. That's right. Um, figure this out on your calculator again. What number do you get on your calculator when you do this? 10 to the negative 9.2. Yes, please. Six point three zero nine, or 6.310 times 10 to the ne times 10 to the negative 10. I just wanted to point out you left out that 10 to the negative 10 here. Okay, and what does that 6.3 times 10 to the negative 10 represent? The Ka. So that would have been a good thing to write here. That represents the Ka. However, notice all of this was unnecessary, again, because what goes into the henderson hasselbalch equation? The pKa or the Ka? The pKa. So all of this work that you did here was unnecessary, although your ge general method here was correct. This is a good method to figure out the Ka if you required. You might um, you might see a question that asks you to find the Ka, and then this would be a good method. But you don't need it for this problem. For this problem, all you need is what you were already given, which is the Ka, and the, which is the pKa. Okay, so to summarize, I, I think there's a very good chance you'll see a question like this. In fact, almost guaranteed you'll see a question like this on the exam. So let's make sure we have this down. So remember, what type of problem is this from the handout? This is a weak acid and base problem. Say that one more time, please. A weak acid and its conjugate base problem? Yeah, it's got to be, it's not any old weak acid and base. It's the weak acid and its conjugate base. So what do you, let, let's see, what do you need to have in your notes about that? First of all, what's, what's a name for a solution with a weak acid and its conjugate base? Well, for a solution. Good. Uh, secondly, you should write down all you need to solve this is the henderson hasselbalch equation. All you need to solve this type of problem is the henderson hasselbalch equation. So thirdly, 
you should have written down that you don't need the before change after table. You don't need the before change after table to solve this type of problem. You can see that because you didn't really use this in your solution. Uh, and also, what do we need for this type of problem? The KA or the PKA? PKA. Because that's what's in the henderson hasselbach equation. So this part of your uh, work was not wrong, but it was also unnecessary. We don't need the, K, the, the KA here. We already had. So all you really, so you did get the right answer here. You did get the right answer, but this was the only work that you needed right here. So that's important because, like I say, you're pretty sure to see that on the exam. Okay, so let's move on to number two. So of the problems on that acid base handout, which type is this? That is a weak acid problem. Oh, which one are you highlighting? Number two. That's a weak acid problem. Uh, and conjugate base. Okay. Now that makes a big difference. Remember, the weak acid problems are solved completely differently than the weak acid plus the conjugate base. It might seem like a minor detail, but it's crucial not to confuse those. Uh, so which type is this? Weak acid and conjugate base problem. That's right. So again, I would make the same comments I made for question one. All you need to solve this is the henderson hasselbach equation. All you need to solve this type of problem is the henderson hasselbach equation. Remember, when we went over this material earlier, what we were trying to emphasize was that all of the different types of problems on the handout are solved differently, and it's very important not to confuse them with each other. I hope that in your notes, you have clearly labeled examples of how to solve all the different types. You should have a clearly uh, labeled example of how to solve a strong acid problem in your notes. You should have a clearly labeled example of how to solve a strong base problem in your notes. You should have a clearly labeled example of how to solve a weak acid problem in your notes. And you should have a clearly labeled example of how to solve a weak acid and its conjugate base problem in your notes. That's what we have here. Okay, um, so again, uh, so let's look, looking at this table. Um, what should what should be the concentration of the fluoride before the reaction begins? It should be 2.4 times 10 to the negative 6. So this number was incorrect. Uh, there's some other mistakes in the table as well, but I won't bother discussing those with you because, again, you don't actually need the table for this type of problem. For this type of problem, you don't need this before change after table. All you need is the henderson hasselbach equation. Now, in this case, uh, this work that you did over here was definitely necessary. You were given the Ka, so you use this approach to find the pKa. That was very good. Um, so, so for this problem, what you needed was just this work down here. Okay, so like question one, you got this correct. You got this correct. That's good. I just wanted to point, excuse me, point out there were some aspects of your solution that were like number three. So your answer here for number three is correct. It would be good to have taken a couple of extra steps and proven this mathematically using this equation. I can see that you wrote down the henderson hasselbach equation here, but then you didn't actually use the equation. So I was saying your answer for number three is correct. Um, I noticed you wrote down the henderson hasselbach equation, but then you didn't actually use the henderson hasselbach equation. So it would be a good exercise to use the henderson hasselbach equation to prove that the ratio is one to one uh, here. We, we went over how to do that in, in our last session. So uh, that would be a good exercise, but uh, I think to save time, we won't do that. We won't do that together in the tutoring session. Anyway, your answer for number three was correct. When the pH is equal to the pKa, uh, you'll get equal amounts of the acid in its conjugate base. Okay. Okay, so I'm looking at the homework problems here. Uh, so the key thing for each problem is to go over the thought process involved. So for question one, uh, it's important for us to look at the work that you did. Uh, you didn't send me your work for question one, so let's try that question on your screen. Try question one on your screen. The important thing is to show me how you would work that out. This question I just remembered from memorizing. I don't um, have a thought process behind it. Okay. Well, that should concern you, right? Because that means that 
if you see another question that's slightly different, you wouldn't be able to solve it, right? Correct. Um, okay. Well, all right. So that's a good thing for us to go into. So do you have any idea how to approach this or no idea? No idea. Okay. Um, any idea what the correct equation is for attacking this problem? Is it the Henderson-Hasselbach? That's all right. That would be a good place to start then. So the first thing to do with any question is to write down a question mark with a good symbol for what the question is asking us. So we'd like to start here, write down a question mark, and then next to that, try to write down a symbol or symbols for what the question is asking us. Okay, that's a good start. Let's try to be a little bit more specific. What does the top of that fraction stand for? Oh. The concentration of the conjugate base. Okay, that's a good way to put it. So the question said A minus <laughs> over HA, but that's not actually the best symbols. We want to improve those symbols. What they mean is the concentrations here. Okay, well now let's write down the equation that you were thinking of using. Okay. Okay. Um, and now we have to try to plug something into this equation for pH and pKa. Um, so I guess one thing we could do here to make this simple is um, just pick a number at random for the pKa. Plug a number in at random for the pKa. Seven. Okay, fair enough. Now let's plug in a number for pH. This number won't be random. <clears throat> Seven. Uh, looks like you kind of picked that at random. Uh, yeah. Do you remember the question? The P. Uh, okay. Okay. Why is eight a good number to pick here? It's one unit above the pKa. Okay. Good. So now let's continue. All right, any idea what we could do next? Bring this over. That's a good idea. Might as well simplify the equation. One is equal to Okay, any idea what we could do next? Uh, rewrite it. Okay. Like 10 to the first is equal to this. Okay. Now what? <coughs> This is like, this is 10. Okay. So 10 is equal to... So that's the ratio. Okay, good. You have to know when you're done. So which choice would you pick? The one, uh, uh, letter C. Letter or, C, yeah, 10 to the first. Okay. All right, so I think you um, you said that when you picked this before, you just kind of picked it because you remembered the answer. But now we can see the method. Um, all right, so I don't know. Uh, did, do you think you got this question right on the test? If you did, I don't know if you're, you you might have done it from memory. I don't know. How do you think you did on this I problem? Picked, I picked actually one ten. Choice one B. Ten. All right, okay, so it looks like you might not have gotten this right. This is not something we worked a lot on together, but... We did go over the tools for this type of problem. I don't know. Did you think of using the Henderson-Hasselbach for equation for this on the test? I just remembered um, the ratio, like going over the ratio, and for some reason I just remembered 1 to 10. Yeah. Okay. One, one. All right. So basically you just kind of tried to answer from memory.
So I, it sounds like you didn't think of using the Henderson Hasselbalch equation here. Okay. Well, this is a, this is maybe a little harder than the questions that we did together. We did kind of go over some of the skills for this, but this is why when whenever we're going through the tutoring, I'm always emphasizing the importance of understanding the skills because the, your instructor is always going to make up different questions than I can think of. You're always going to have to adapt to what the question to the questions your instructor has given you. Uh, so this this is a problem that required some adaptation that I think we didn't see on the test. All right. Well, anyway, now we've seen how to do it. Well, let's review the techniques that we used here that you might use in the future. Um, one thing that you might not have done is write down a question mark with symbols for the question. I think it's really useful here just to focus on what the question is asking us. Concentration of A minus over HA. That's a really helpful strategy for many problems in, in, in science. That's a good strategy. We wrote down the equation. Then we used kind of a sophisticated strategy. Since we weren't told the pH and we weren't told the pKa, we just made up a number for the pKa. That might seem like a weird technique, but do you see that no matter what number you make up for the pKa, as long as the pH is one bigger, you're always going to get the same answer? Yeah. Okay, so that's why that's a useful technique here. So that, that's just a technique to add to your toolkit. If the problem is very vague, sometimes it helps to just make up a number for one of the variables. But notice, once you make up a number for pKa, you can't just make up a number for pH. The pH, if you, if you say the pKa is 7, you have to have the pH is 8. So that's a little bit of a sophisticated strategy, but that, that's sometimes a good technique on these types of problems. Uh, then the rest of the problem is something that we did work on quite a bit. I think we worked a lot on how to rewrite equations with logs without the logarithm. So that's a technique that uh, you definitely might have been able to use here. Huh? Okay, so anyway, now we've gone over this skill, and uh, maybe this will come in handy uh, later. So question one here was similar to the previous one. I was trying to trick you, though, because this question is not exactly the same as the one we did before. Um, here, the ratio wasn't 10 to 1, but 1 to 10. But it looks like you weren't tricked. Uh, you did it separately, and you figured it out. The one tricky thing here is notice that you just made up a number for pKa. You just made up a number. How is that legal? Well, it's okay as long as your pH is one unit smaller than the pKa, so it's consistent with the numbers you were given. Notice if you had picked 9 and 8, you would get the same answer. If you picked 3 and 2, you would get the same answer. So you can see it doesn't matter what numbers you pick. Uh, okay, all right, so, um, so you did pick the correct choice, uh, choice B, for that problem. Uh, maybe that will come in useful later in the course. These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos by making a monthly pledge at my Patreon page. Or you can make a one-time payment by using the PayPal donate button on my website. Thank you.